I wanted to be cool. I wanted to be accepted. And uh, so I started kind of diving deeper into that music. The, the worst, the heaviest, the darkest, the darker it was, uh, the more aggressive it was, the more I wanted it. And I was unknowingly becoming drawn into a deep world of darkness and evil. You're talking to the metalhead, right? I was the church metalhead guy, Mohawk and the spiky bracelets and my combat boots. I did not want to go sit through yet another sermon that I knew I was going to fail at. I said, Lord, I'm, I'm just done. I can't do this. You demand holiness from us and I can't do it. I closed my eyes. There was no introduction. There was no warning. There was no nothing. Instantly, I was engulfed in flames. I was staring at and I was in the presence of the absolute source of pure evil, unimaginable. And the evil coming from these things was so bad, even my spirit body couldn't handle it. The instant I stopped screaming, three of them ran up to me so fast. I, I just could not believe what I was seeing. I knew that I was going to be in this place forever and ever and ever and ever. Hi, welcome to Touching the Afterlife. This is Julie. Our guest today is Joel. Joel has a powerful testimony. At one point, he used to be into the dark music scene. He was beginning to feel some frustration and condemnation, and he cried out to God, and God gave him a miracle. And then later on, he God showed him hell. So welcome with me today, Joel. Hi, Joel. Thank you so much for being with me. Hello, Julie. Thank you for having me. So today, Joel, I would love for you to start out with uh, maybe when it all began, you were into some dark music scenes and arts. Do you want to start there? Absolutely. During the preteen years, when I went from uh, elementary school to middle school, that was such a transition. You know, I wasn't hanging out with kids my age anymore with our colorful backpacks and lunchboxes. I was now in a school with people years older than me with long hair jean jackets, Metallica, Iron Maiden, Slayer, and they scared me, but they intrigued me at the same time. And that's where I began to feel this job. I wanted to be cool. I wanted to be accepted. And uh, so I started kind of diving deeper into that music and it wouldn't be long before I was listening to, and I don't know how I could looking back, but I was listening to the hardcore satanic bands like Deicide, which means the death of God, Cannibal Corpse, Morbid Angel, the, the worst, the heaviest, the darkest, the darker it was, the, the more aggressive it was, the more I wanted it. And going into uh, high school, it was a whole nother school. And going there, I was the only long-haired headbanger in school. So to say I didn't have any friends was an understatement. Um, it was rough. But I ended up making a friend who was also a metalhead. And we began, you know, at that time I was wanting to learn guitar, which I was, but he knew it a lot better than me. And he took me in like a brother and like a brother. And I, we became very close, but it was, you know, at that age where you want to be, you're feeling rejection from others. You're feeling acceptance from others. And I'm not realizing I'm being drawn to these people. And I was unknowingly becoming drawn into a deep, world of darkness and evil. Hmm. So, Joel, from that point, what was next? Did you start, were you in a band? Where did you go from there? Yeah, we, we had been practicing quite a lot. We wanted to form a band like any teenager, rockhead, metalhead musician would want to. Mm -hmm. But what the turning point was one day when he, I was at his house, uh, he, he wanted me to wait in the garage. He had something to show me. He went inside, he comes back out with the poster board, and he had this drawing of this demonic entity. And it looked hideous and evil. It was in a black cloak. And, I, and of course, I'm, oh, cool, what is this all about? And he said, I have a name for our band. I said, what's that? And he said, Necronomicon, which I'd never heard that word in my life. I said, what is that? He said, it's the book of the dead, a book of the damned. Just like God has the book of life, 
Satan has the book of the dead. Not thinking twice about it, I said, let's do it. And little did I know in that moment, I opened a doorway. I made an agreement with the enemy, uh, uh, some sort of a tie with the enemy. And that very night would begin. I mean, the downward spiral was already bad enough, but now it got real bad. And that's when I began. He introduced me to drugs. His mother was a hardcore Wiccan. She had some cool things she wanted to show me. But almost nightly from that moment of agreement with him and the enemy on, I would have the worst demonic encounters in the night. All kinds. Being levitated, scratched, seeing all kinds of demons and all their various kinds of forms. And the drug use got so bad. I was uh, into the methamphetamines. I lost everything to methamphetamines. I couldn't get enough. And finally, at the age of 19, I had to come to wits and say, okay, something's wrong. Something's terribly wrong with my life. I used to know this God. I used to know his son, Jesus, if even a glimpse. But I, I knew him and I loved him. What's become of me? I was ready to receive Jesus into my life. Wow. So at that point at 19, is that when you began going to church and then take us from there? Yes. So when I gave my, when I did receive Jesus into my life, it was get baptized, which I didn't really know what that meant. I thought you just went in the water, you came out and then you started speaking tongues and healing people. And I realized, well, that doesn't happen. And no one mentored me. So from 19 on, I just thought, assumed it was up to me to stop doing this and that and start doing the other things. And the more I made myself righteous by my own willpower and <laughs> tenacity, mm. then I would be close to Jesus eventually. Right. So it was almost like a to-do list. A to-do list, yeah. yeah. Stop doing this, start doing that, and Jesus will love you more. Mm. Yeah. So Jesus shook things up for you and showed you something and, and broke that off of you. Sh tell us about how that, what happened. Yeah. So at the... Uh, how strange when I think about it just now, you know, at the age of 33, I would like to think, if you will, I was doing pretty good, right? Uh, not with the attitude of, well, at least I'm not that person. But I mean, there so many bondages had been removed. Um, I had just quit smoking, too. I was so happy about that. That was the hardest thing of all. And I finally, I'm like, I'm past this. This is great. I'm just, but that Sunday morning, it was sometime in April. I was, uh, by that time, I'm 33 years old. So from the age of 19 to 33, I'm trying to do it myself. Yes, I'm seeing things change, but inside of me, I still feel like that same, there's, the inside of me is still me. Yeah, maybe I'm not doing it anymore, but I still want it. Or maybe I stopped doing that, but I'm all I did was replace it with something else. So I'm, am I really any better? And that Sunday morning, I woke up in this, in my spirit, I was just so sad. And it was a Sunday morning. And I just, it's not that I didn't want to go to church because I had other things to do. It was that I did not want to go sit through yet another sermon that I knew I was going to fail at. And it was, it was try and fail, try and fail, try and fail. And I was so frustrated. I did just say out loud to the Lord. I threw my hands up. I said, Lord, I'm, I'm just done. I can't do this. You demand holiness from us, and I can't do it. I try, but I fail, Jesus, and I quit. And right in that moment, and this was uh, one of the first times that I do remember hearing from him, spirit to spirit. It wasn't some audible voice like the Ten Commandments, but his spirit was speaking to my spirit. And I got to tell you, I had no doubt in my mind that it was him. It was absolutely Yeshua. And he was so peaceful, so reassuring, so gracious and kind. And he spoke to me like in a whisper. And he said, Joel, I want you to be in fellowship this morning. Go, go, be in my presence. Come into my presence and be in fellowship this morning. And so I said, okay. And so I went and, um, as worship was going, you know, I decided I, I'm not going to go with a bad attitude and sit there with my arms folded, hiding in the corner. I'm going to go with my, with all my broken heart. I'm going to go. And so I sang too with all that I could. 
And um, I tried to smile. I tried to be nice, you know. And so we all sat and the pastor came out and uh, and he began the message. Um, and I'll just keep going, Julie, okay? Please. Okay. So he comes out and the message is titled, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. So I'm thinking, okay, I get the gist. But I'm listening. I'm listening. And he starts, he opens the Bible and he starts speaking. He's not even two minutes in. And he's in the middle of a sentence and he just stops. And he's staring straight ahead and his eyes are this wide. And he's not saying a word. And he's just, it's like he's looking at someone. And after a little bit, we're looking at each other thinking, is he okay? What's going on? This had never happened before or since. And then after a minute, he kind of blinks and he's looking around at us. And he says, you guys, um, I'm sorry, this, this has never happened to me before. The Lord just stopped me. He said, we need to stop the sermon, stop everything right now. We need to come before his throne in prayer. And we're, we're all like, okay, well, let's go. And so he said, everybody, let's just close our eyes, bow our heads, and come before the Lord in prayer. Mm. And I said, okay. So I close my eyes, and I'm bowing my head. And everything is going dark. And I had no idea what was about to come next. As I'm closing my eyes and things are going dark, in the spirit, I'm opening my eyes and everything is becoming bright. Wow. So you felt like you were, you didn't feel like you were in church praying. You were in this place. That it, That's what it seemed like you were there. I guarantee you where I was, was nowhere on earth. I was immediately the glory of God. And I, sorry, I can't tell you. I knew it. I was, I was getting ready for this and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to cry, but it's impossible. Mm -hmm. The glory of God, the power of his might and his majesty hit me. The, old, the best and only way I could describe it, Julie, is it would be like if you were standing right in front of a supernova. His power, his majesty, his might, his glory, his radiance, his authority over all things, all things just came over me in the most spectacular light a light and a brilliance millions and millions and millions of times beyond any sun in our universe. And I kind of stepped back and I, <laughs> and I just remembered all I could say was, oh, wow. Oh, wow. And then I could start to see more in front of me and around of me. And I realized I was standing on top of a large grassy hilltop absolutely beautiful every single blade of grass was perfect and pristine and not just alive biologically but alive and um, flowers here and there and all over the place that you would never see here on earth and just everything you know since seeing heaven, you know, when I drive about now, it, it doesn't regardless wherever I'm at, as beautiful as it is, there's always that one dead twig to just ruin that perfect tree or that, you know, that grass is great, but there, you just see the little spots where there isn't. And just imagine if there was none of that. Everything was perfectly alive. Hmm. It was so amazing. And what really threw me for a loop was watching the blades of grass and the flowers swaying like this. And I, and I knew it was not the wind. They were praising God. Every blade of grass, every flower, every tree, <laughs> the birds, the fish, the water, the rocks, everything is praising God and singing to him all together in the most perfect harmony. If you were to hear this music of heaven here on earth, I'm telling you now, you would collapse to your knees. You, you just wouldn't be able to handle it. And I just was marveling at all this. Everything is singing to God continually without ceasing. And I'm taking all this in. And then 
Um, I'm seeing beyond that now. And from down at the bottom of the hill, it went into a very large and very lush and very gorgeous valley that just extended on, on beyond the edge of sight. And it, within this valley, there were, who knows, millions and millions and millions of people. And I knew everyone was, it was like a gathering and a celebration unto the Lord. Mm. You know, up until this point of, of seeing heaven, um, and even to this day, but especially up until this point, I was such an introvert and so, had social anxiety. I really did. I, I wanted to be at church. I wanted to be in fellowship, but I had to make myself go and make myself smile and shake hands with people. And it just made me so uncomfortable. But where I was in heaven, none of that existed. In heaven, there is no such thing as personal bubbles and personal spaces. Because in heaven, what I was feeling with just absolute surety was this intimacy. Everyone knew everyone perfectly, so perfectly. And the love connection between everyone wow. was just flawless, blameless, and perfect. Oh, that, I love that so much because we just, there's so many barriers here and it sounds like there's none there uh just love love yes. Mm. yes even the most um you know i think of a think of a marriage relationship is as intimate as you could be with your husband here on earth wait till you're together in heaven to with your children your your family members people that you've known as friends Maybe people that at, at one time here you didn't get along with, but you're um, you're reunited in heaven and it's all gone. All the sin, your mistakes, their mistakes, you know, what you did to hurt them, what they did to hurt, all of that is gone. It's gone. And you are in the perfect love of God together. Even so much so, I would see people that I just knew, like at this one person, they just leap for joy. Like you can't contain yourself. And, and now I see why when Jesus said, unless you become like little children, you, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Because in heaven, you just, you're like a child. You can't hold that joy in. You can't hold a straight face and compose yourself. And, and boy, isn't this wonderful? You know, you are just leaping for joy and praising God with all that you have in you. And you could, I could just, I could go up to anyone I wanted, just grab them by the hands and you just spin in circles and you would just laugh together and rejoice together. It didn't matter who. But what was interesting is that, and I was, and of course, I'm so enraptured by all this. These, some of these things I, I realize now, you know, what being, having experienced it was that I was alone on that hill by myself. And I was simply observing all of these people and all of these things. It was fascinating to see the, the attire of people because previous to this experience, I just somehow imagined if you're clothed in white, <laughs> I just pictured like God took this white blanket. He cut a hole in it, put it over you and said, there, that's, that's how you're jamming. And it was not that. Yes, people's robes are made white, sparkling white in the blood of the lamb, but each we're all so uniquely blessed in heaven too. There, you're not just another number. You're not another number here to God on earth, and you're not another number to Him in heaven. Everyone is so uniquely loved and so uniquely clothed in His righteousness. Some people had blue embroidery, some red, some gold, some with sashes. They were all white robes, but even the linen was sewn in unique patterns. It was just incredible to see. I saw that when God clothes us in his own righteousness, he makes sure we look good. Wow, that's incredible. Like it's custom made, you know, just yeah. like we're uniquely made. So yes, then, yes. Yeah. So tell us then what about when Jesus, you and Jesus met yes. face to face. Yes, okay. So I'm observing this immense, innumerable uh, gathering, this crowd before me. And then suddenly off to my right, 
I start to see the crowd parting in the middle. And I'm watching people like this in excitement and they're looking and they're kind of whispering to each other. And they just have the biggest smiles. And then in walks this man. Sorry about that. I got a cat. He's going to annoy us. Sorry. <laughs> I'm surprised he's been good for this long. <laughs> hey, I love cats. If he wants to make a cameo, so be it. <laughs> <laughs> and everything stopped. He was robed and attired in righteousness and in truth. His splendor was one that could only be adored, but never equaled. The crown on his head emanated forth the glory of God with such magnitude that if you did not know him and and he and you and that glory of God came upon you, I I could be wrong, but I at least got the feeling you would just be absolutely decimated. And it's no wonder that people fall at his feet as though dead. He, what was really neat, and what I really want to share is, you, oh, viewers, you have to understand, you know, it's called the supernatural because that's what it is. It is supernatural. Being here, being here in this realm, in this little mist we call life, in physicality, we're limited. We can only see so much of the uh, light spectrum. We can only hear so much sound. We, uh, our brains can only process so much data coming in, right? We're limited. But in heaven, there are no limitations on anything. That's why you hear things you won't hear here on earth. You see colors you won't see here on earth. Everything is magnitudes upon magnitudes. And I could go on and on and on. I honestly have no idea where the end of that would be. Magnitudes upon magnitudes times the infinity power. It is that much more real and dynamic. And that also means um, you, you see things differently too. You can see behind you without having to turn your head. You can see multiple things all at once. Time is so different in, in uh, the spiritual realm. So different, so much more dynamic. I get now why... Um, you know, when I think when we think about the Lord is his eternal aspect, right? He forever was. OK, I can kind of get that. He forever shall be. OK, I can sort of get that. But think about the fact that if he forever was, if he forever will be, he forever is. He is forever internally in this moment. And that's how he can answer the prayers of billions and billions of people all at the same time. And it's just another day at the office for the Lord. He is at all places, at all times, infinitely. That's the one that really gets me. So when I'm looking at this man walking in, the only way I could describe it in the physical would be if you closed your uh, right eye and I was looking at him, he had on what I now know to be, I didn't really at the time, a priestly robe. It was a purple robe. It was so fine, so beautiful. Purple and then sort of bluish hues here and there. And then he had on his chest this uh, golden kind of a sash, and across it were very precious stones. And then in his right hand, he had a rod like a staff. But if you were to close your left eye and look at him, I saw his mighty crown. He was wearing his robe was this pure white that was just so different. It's hard to describe. It was just so, that is so beautiful, so immaculate, so spectacular. But it's not like... Some people do nowadays. They're just their attire is just way overboard, and everything's you know it it portrayed his it portrayed who he is. That's the best way I could describe it. It was not show offish at all, but it was marvelous and spectacular to behold. He had a golden sash going down like this, and I was seeing all of that at the same time. I was seeing him as our high priest. And I was seeing him as our king, the king above all kings, all at the same time. And um, then, then I saw his eyes. Oh, my goodness. I will never be the same. His eyes, in his, his eyes are like living waters. 
his eyes were so full of truth. Pure, pure, undefiled, spotless, perfect truth. We think about like how pure diamonds are. This, a diamond would be just like some other rock laying there compared to the truth in his eyes. The peace, true peace. The peace that says, my life is in the hand of my heavenly father. My life is hidden with Christ in the Lord. I am seated in heavenly places. I am sealed with the Holy Spirit. I belong to the one who does not fail, who does not make mistakes. It is going to be okay. It was that kind of peace. In his eyes, I saw this. He will not tolerate lies. He will not tolerate those who practice deceit mm -hmm. at all. It kind of scared me. It was that solid and that real. And um, I know people have seen Jesus in their own way. That's fine. All I can say is what I saw. This is what I saw. His eyes were a light blue, blue like the ocean waters, blue like, uh, you know, coral reef waters like that just so beautiful and full of life and then sort of green uh towards the middle just sparkling dazzling and then they they it, it, like a gold <laughs> it, it's so hard to describe heaven in the physical yeah but that's what i saw and then finally i shouted out it's jesus it's jesus mm -hmm. Want me to keep going? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't stop. <laughs> if all of this wasn't enough, I mean, I really, besides, oh, wow, and it's Jesus, I couldn't speak. What could I say except, oh, wow, and it's Jesus. I was, I'm looking at Jesus. I There he, he's. That's Jesus. I was just, <laughs> anyways, here's, but if none of that, if any of that wasn't enough to blow anyone away, it was what he did. He walks into this crowd. And the first thing he does, he locks eyes on the nearest person to him and not running, but very quickly, his arms are outstretched like this. And he goes right up to that person. He, they grab each other like this. He's grabbing them by the shoulders. They grab Jesus by the shoulders, and they pull each other in. Their arms are wrapped around each other so tight. Jesus has his, his chin across their shoulder like this, and they are just – it was the bear hug of all time, hugging each other, just swaying like this. It was as if in that moment the entire universe had disappeared and everything in it, and it was just Jesus. And just that person. And they, and they, you know, when, when you, when you come to that place where you know who you are in him, when you truly abide in him and he abides in you and that intimacy is there, you run to him. And that's what they did. And then he took him by the shoulders again and his eyes were locked into theirs and they were just talking just like you and I would talk. That's how close to Jesus that person was. That was that level of intimacy where they, where Jesus ended and where that person began, no one knew and no one cared. That's how close they were. And then he, he said something to them just for them and just blessed them. And then he went on to the next person. And this is where that time of heaven, I can't describe. I don't know how long it was. I, I didn't care to know. No one else did either. He could have spent a thousand years with that person or 10 minutes. No one, it just didn't matter. It's, it's, it's irrelevant in heaven. On to the next person. And everyone else is standing there just like I was like this. You just adore the moment. You just see that love connection. No, no more barriers. No more. Pure, complete, total intimacy. And he went to the next person. 
And this guy, he leans in and kind of says something to in Jesus's ear. And Jesus goes back laughing. He was laughing so hard. I mean, his head was all the way back. And he has the most amazing smile. And when Jesus laughs, you, it's such a contagious laugh. And everyone's laughing. And I'm laughing. And he was just laughing so hard. And, you know, they sort of compose themselves. And he grabs them by the shoulder again. And he's talking to them. And then he stops mid-sentence. He's, he goes up straight like this. His eyes are straight ahead. And then he turns. And his eyes go straight into mine. I was not ready for that. I was fine observing. I was just fine. I couldn't have been more content. And when his eyes locked into mine, immediately I knew he saw the furthest depths and the totality of my existence and all its eternal aspect, everything. He knew and saw everything about me more than even I knew. But that love in his eyes, he didn't bat an eye. And his body, so he turned like this. So then his body lines up with his head and he starts going straight for me through the crowd. There's people in the crowd and then the hill going up to where I'm standing. And he's making his way through the crowd and his eyes never left their fixation on me. Ever, not for a split second. He was just doing moving people like this and just focused on me coming towards me. And I stumbled backwards. I could, I, in that moment, I freaked out. It's amazing how in heaven, because I'd always wondered about this, are, are we going to be like holy robots now? Like we're now, now we're, now we're holy. We just kind of don't have a choice kind of thing. That's not it. You are you, the unique you, the funny you, you know, the dork you, whoever you are, you are absolutely you, but you are you without the curse of sin anymore. And so you know, we, I think of when John, when uh, John's, you know, his writing of the book of Revelation, right? He cried, you know, he, there he is in the glory of heaven. And someone cries out, you know, who's, who is worthy to loosen the seal and open the scroll? And John cried because no one was found worthy there for the moment. But the angel comforted him and said, don't cry. Behold, the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth, he has overcome. He is worthy. So it's okay. It is totally okay. It's just you are the realest, awesomest version of you you could ever be. Complete free will, complete freedom, but no more sin. Hallelujah. So I freaked out. And I said, no, no, there is no way that you who are holy, who are righteous and true, is going to have anything to do with me. A sinner, a wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked sinner. And I turned and I ran as hard as I could in the opposite direction. Mm. Um, this is where you can have that 360 view because I'm running away. I'm looking ahead of me, but in the spirit, I could see behind me. And I could see Jesus even with, with such urgency. Of course, he's polite. He's a gentleman. But he's, you know, getting people out of his way. And people are stepping aside. And he's getting them out of the way. And he, now he's starting to run. And he's running up that hill. And I'm running as hard as I can. But I can, I can hear him getting closer and closer. And I'm thinking, wow, he runs fast. There's no outrunning the love of Jesus. There, you can't escape his love. And he was getting closer and closer. And I knew it was pointless to stop running. And, and so I stopped running. I just closed my eyes. I closed my eyes and just bowed my head. Then there was no way I was turning around. There was no way. I couldn't. I just couldn't. And I felt him approach me. I could just, he's so close. You can feel the warmth of his body. 
And then I felt him put his arms around me like this. And he pulled me into his chest as hard and as tight as he could. And he rested his chin. I could feel his beard on my cheek. I've never felt love like that ever. And for a minute, he, he just didn't say anything. And that was, you know, he, I just lost it. I lost it. His love was just so overwhelming. And I couldn't resist it. There was just, stop resisting it, Joel. Just take hold of it. And he just held me. And uh, after a minute, then he, he whispered in my ear. He said, Joel, you're not looking for love in all the right places. Remember, that was the sermon the pastor had for the day. He said, you're here in church. You're, you're, in, you're right where I want you to be. Gosh, you guys, his voice, it is like living waters, many living waters. So gentle and understanding. He lived here on earth. He, he lived the human life. And he died that horrible, undeserved death. He, went, he knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be rejected and hated for no reason. He dealt with it all. And so I had that understanding, you know, that empathy in his voice and that reassurance in his voice was so marvelous, so beautiful. It's just so calming and so peaceful. His voice, just the character of his voice says, I understand. I understand completely. It's okay. It's okay. But uh, he said, uh, you're, where, you're, you're here where I want you to be. But he said, Joel, you keep running from me. And that's how he was speaking. Just, just a hint above a whisper. And with such passion and yearning, like, Joel, you keep running from me. Stop running from me. Let me love you. And when he said that, he, that was his words, but the understanding I had was even greater. It was, let me love you right here, right now, in this moment, right where you're at in life. There is nothing that you can do in this life. There is just nothing that you could do that could possibly make me love you more than I do right now and forever. Amen. Those three words gave that full picture and understanding to me. So Joel is after that, is that when you came out of it and back in your, your body at church? How did you come out of that? Was that around the right time you came out? Not quite yet. He had oh. no surprise for me. All right. Tell us the surprise. He's embracing me and I kind of feel him stand up. And all of a sudden, I start to feel warm oil being poured from the top of my head and going all the way down me. And I have to tell you, if Jesus hadn't been holding on to me, I would have plopped on the floor like a fish. I would not have been able to stand up. It was so I could never possibly quite describe that feeling. I have never felt anything like it. It was the most beautiful, incredible sensation. It went over me and through me and consumed me. And I didn't know really, at all. I just remember thinking at the time, it was like, that feels, it feels like warm oil. Whatever's going on feels like warm oil. And I just went completely limp. I couldn't even stand, move, talk, speak. I was done for in the most beautiful way imaginable, done for. And then as the oil went all the way over me and in me and through me and consumed me, um, that's when I suddenly, I started to be, I started hearing people praying and then things started kind of going dark again. And then the praying, and then I started like, oh, there's people around me praying. And then I kind of started blinking my eyes, and I had been crying so hard. My eyes were almost swollen shut. And <laughs> no joke, snot was hanging from my nose to the floor. 
and I'm blinking and I'm trying to get my bearings. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm at church. I'm at church and we're praying. And so I'm looking around and everybody's just in fervent prayer. And then the Lord God Almighty, oh, holy, holy, holy is he. he his voice thundered within me. It was the good kind of fear. Now I get the fear of the Lord. Now I get it. His voice thundered within me. The place you are in is holy. Remove your shoes. Kaboom. It was like that. Yes, sir. I, I, again, introvert, not right now. The Lord just spoke and I'm doing it. And I was kind of sitting in the middle. I didn't care. I just did not care what anyone thought at that moment. Look at me, think what you think. I do not care. He spoke, I obey. And again, you're talking to the metalhead, right? I was the church metalhead guy, Mohawk and the spiky bracelets and my combat boots. So I'm like, oh man, combat boots today. But I didn't care. I did them, did them from the top down, took those off, took my socks off, and I got on my knees right then and there. And I could not praise him enough. I just, I could not worship him enough i get it now why i always used to like eternity in heaven that's a long time to be in heaven but now i get it we will be in eternity with the lord forever and ever and ever because that is how long it is going to take to praise him and worship him and glorify him the way he deserves it will take infinity to get the job done Ooh, wow Oh, what an amazing, amazing experience in heaven and the details. It's just so, oh. Well, what was it? Four or five years later, the Lord also gave you a vision. Yes, yes. Um, it's kind of weird how you can go through such an experience like that, but once... Once you're back here and you just, you, you're living life. And that's what I was doing. I, I was just working hard. Just uh, my wife at the time and I had worked. We spent seven years saving all of our nickels and dimes to get a down payment so we could finally get out of our beat up old trailer and get a house. And we did. And it was just such a beautiful time. We're getting our house the way we want it. And I'm enjoying yard work. Like, this is great. I love beautiful house, beautiful house. And uh, that day was just such a normal day. No drama, normal. I went to work. I worked. I came home. We made dinner. We ate, we ate dinner. We watched some TV. And pretty soon it was time to go to bed, We'd go to work tomorrow. And we go to the bedroom and it was good night, good night. And I I always lay on my side. So I rolled to my side, pulled the sheets over, closed my eyes, and faster than you could snap your fingers. I was no longer in my body and I was no longer on earth. I, it's very important to tell everybody because I know some people will comment that or assume, oh, it was just a dream. It was a really bad dream. Let me tell you something. My entire life, I've been a light sleeper. I never once in my life have laid down, closed my eyes, and boom, I'm asleep, ever. I don't care how tired I am. I've gone days without sleeping, absolute exhaustion, and it, I still have to get my mind to wind down. I'm that kind of sleeper. Um, I closed my eyes. There was no introduction there was no warning. There was no nothing. Instantly, I was engulfed in flames. And they were, they were coming across from uh, my right to my left and absolutely consuming me. Before I had a chance to think, I, I, it was just I was instantly in absolute chaos. And the pain, that's another thing I want to share in, in your dreams, you don't feel pain like what I was feeling because it, it's a pain beyond physicality. The pain I was feeling in that moment, if I had been feeling that here in this physical body, my brain would have shut down because it would have been on overload. The pain that 
encompassed me and, and consumed me was so horrendous. I instantly began screaming and I'm talking screaming, you guys. And if you don't mind, Julie, there's only a couple times, and this is one of them, I have to be graphic because the severity of hell and the horrors of hell, you are, are the only way I could describe this screaming. You have to understand I'm a man, right? I'm a man. Like I, I didn't cry out like a man. I didn't wail like a man. I, the pain had me so bad. I was, I, my head went up and I began screaming like a woman who was being tortured. That's, and I'm sorry, but that is the only possible way to describe it. Anything else, I would be undercutting it. I was screaming like that. And it was a torrent of flames and the flames um, to my understanding, you know, they kind of change colors the hotter they get. You know, it could be a dark red and orange. Um, these flames were so hot that for the most part, it was white and kind of pinkish. It was that hot and it was that intense. And um, now, now I know um, in that moment, it was as if, and I've known of at least one other person, uh, Bill Weiss, the 23 minutes in hell, he, his experience was the same, that it was in that moment, it's like the Lord rewires your mind so that you're a person who is not a believer. You're a person who wants nothing to do with God. And now here you are spending the rest of your eternity like that as well. So I'm at first, I'm like, where am I? What is this place? What's going? You're, all these thoughts are hitting you at the same time. And you to say panic doesn't even describe it. You know, your body's completely just being burned and roasted alive. And so I remember I looked down at my left arm because of the pain. It was just my entire being. It wasn't just the burning from the outside to the inside. It was the whole thing at once. And I looked down at my arms and I could not believe what I was seeing. Um, my arm was a skinny, shriveled, decaying it looked like a corpse it was discolored like it had been rotting forever i i just could not believe what i was seeing and i the spirit flesh it's hard to describe the spirit realm because as a spirit you're not just some misty thing you you're a body but you're a spirit body it's just different than our physical bodies, but it is a body nonetheless. I had a body, but it was a spirit body. And my spirit flesh, if you will, it was burning and sizzling, and then chunks of, this, of it would just fall off and hit the floor. I am freaking out. And I remembered I looked over to my right arm, and it was the same thing, just searing fire coming off and pieces of flesh burning and falling to the floor. But when I looked back to my left arm, the flesh that had just fallen off had regenerated and it was burning and falling off all again. And I realized in that moment that wherever, whatever part of your body you're not looking at is regenerating so that you can watch it burn and fall all over again. In addition to this screaming, I, it was just a, a scream that doesn't end scream, but at the exact same time. And again, this goes back to the, how vastly superior the spirit realm is over the physical realm. It is not limited at all. No limitations. So multiple things happen at the exact same time. And in those realms, it's just the norm. It just makes sense. But then you come back here and, and now it doesn't make sense again. I'm telling you, when you're in the spirit, it makes sense. Eternity makes sense. It all makes sense. Um, so I'm screaming, but at the exact same time I'm screaming, I'm suffocating, and these toxic, sulfurous fumes, I mean, just this putrid stench of rotting flesh, feces, sulfur, anything like that was just burrowing up my nose, and I can only describe it like if you had been forced into a vacuum chamber and all the air's gone, and you're suffocating, and you're suffocating, and you have that panic, right? I can't breathe, and you're panicking, but you don't die. You're perpetually stuck in that state of panic. I'm going to die. I'm going to die, but you don't die. 
And then while all that's happening, someone releases toxic fumes into, into that gas chamber. And your lungs take in the fumes out of desperation. You just suck it all in, but it's poisonous. It's acidic. It's sulfurous. It's toxic. It's wretched, rinsing. And you're sucking this in out of desperation, but you're not suffocating. That was exactly what I was experiencing in that moment. And this felt real. I mean, it didn't feel like, uh, wake me up, I'm in a dream. You felt like you were in this place. The thought of wake up, this has to be a dream, never even occurred to me. Never even occurred to me. Just like if you, you know, I know I've, you know, we witness certain horrible things here on earth. And I know the brain kind of freaks out about it. And you're like, did that just happen? It was not that there. There was no, this has to be a dream. This has to be a, because it was so far beyond this reality. When you're, when you're in the spirit, you simply grasp things in the spirit. Mm -hmm. and did you see anything else? Yeah. So what I began, um, what I began to see in front of me, because you're all, you're, you're just this, you're, you're, you're frantic. You're almost like an, a rabid animal. You're almost on the verge of insanity because you're just so terrified and horrified and all of this. And in such an indescribable pain, and it's happening at the same time. You're just desperate. You're desperate for anything. And so I'm just looking around and then I could start to see that I was actually in like a tunnel or a chamber. And, um, if I had to guess, it was, you know, kind of like a cavern, if you will, about 25 foot across and overhead, just going around like that. And then I saw I was in a seated position up against the wall and I was chained too. I was chained. My ankles were chained. I was chained to the wall. I knew that too. And instantly I knew that where I was, there was no water, there was no air, there was no light, and there was no life. Those four things absolutely do not exist whatsoever where I was. And it can sound confusing in this realm, but I'm telling you, when you're in the spirit realm, it's not confusing. You're permeated with darkness. It's not just all around you. It's in you, in your soul, in your spirit, that outer darkness that Jesus warned of. You're experiencing that darkness of being absolutely out of the presence of the light of, of God. And now you're in absolute darkness and it is blacker than any black that could ever exist um, here on earth. Even the furthest reaches of the universe don't touch how black it is when you're completely separated from God. However, you do see, you see everything and you have to see. I knew that I didn't have eyeballs. All I had were empty sockets. I just, you just know these things. And so I couldn't close my eyes. I had to watch everything. I didn't have ears like these, just holes in the side of my head. So I had to hear everything. You have to experience everything and you experience it. It's not an exaggeration. It's millions and millions of times in magnitudes, more clear, distinct and felt and, and experienced than anything that we, that we could in the physical and I see these rocks, and then again, the flame's going from my right down to my left. So I look down to my left, and I could just see that this tunnel, this chamber just goes on and on as far as I can see. And then um, I start to look to my right to kind of see where the flames are coming from, and that's when I saw a man uh, also seated next to me. He's just far enough away that I couldn't touch him. He couldn't touch me. I knew I couldn't talk to him, and he couldn't talk to me. Um, but what's interesting is as soon as I saw him, I knew everything about him instantly. Everything. Just that mm -hmm. quick. And just the need to know is I knew his name was James. I knew he died at the age of 55 from a heart attack. And I also knew that he did not value his body. He did not value his life. And he especially did not value God. He wanted nothing to do with God. And if there was a God, he hated his guts. That's how he lived his life. And this man was obese. And I found it shocking that even in hell, he was obese. And on his stomach, 
you know, and he, he's consumed in the flames too, obviously. On his stomach, these bubbles would begin to form, like boiling bubbles from the heat. And then they would pop, and the smoke and stench would roll up his body right into his nostrils and go down into him. And he just had to face, he was just constant. It was just, it's ever before you. The way you live here on earth is ever before you and always against you in hell. And I, he looked up. Again, he had nothing but black sockets, too. He looked up towards heaven as if pleading. But even I knew it was a waste of time. It was too late for him. And I could feel that in him. It's too late. And his head went down. And he began bobbing his head and sobbing. But there are no tears in hell. But he just sobbed. And as far as I know, he wasn't aware of my presence. He never acknowledged my presence. Never, he never said a word. But I got to I, I was forced to see his torment for my own torment. I don't want to forget to mention too that um, looking at my body too, just the the whole of me, it was just this skinny, frail corpse. That's all it looked like. Um, I always forget the, the guy's name that uh, ice men that they found on some iceberg. Thousands of years old, well preserved, Uzi or Orzi, the Ice Man, they called him. Um, I remember watching a documentary. They, you know, they were showing the corpse, you know, that they had found, and I almost fell out of my chair. I was like, "That's exactly what I look like. That's what I look like." If you can think of that, uh, Julie, and put a picture of it, if you'd like, because okay. I, I know that'll shock people too to see that. No joke. That is exactly what I look like. What, Ozzy the Iceman, whatever. And on my body, these worms, they were about six to maybe eight inches long. You know, they're all kind of different size, but they were kind of a cloudy white looking number. And they clung to my arms and on uh, all over my body too. And they were absolutely sickening. Not, It wasn't like a leech because they, they look more like worms, but they just, they would stick to your body and just sear you. And they would kind of crawl like an inchworm would. They'd kind of come up and just crawl. And the smell that came from them was by far the worst, though by far the worst of any of the smells. And then they just, as and the fire just went right through them. It consumed me and, and ate me alive, but it went right through these worms. And then they burrowed. They would begin burrowing into my arms and into my body and just eating their way through me. And I mean, if you, just when you think these flames can't be bad enough, now you have these worms violating you like that, crawling wherever they want to, in and through you, just eating their way. It's like having uh, a white hot nail slowly pulled through your veins. It was just that horrible. I'm just, okay. So uh, now I'm, I'm, again, I'm desperate for something else, something else, something else, something else. This, but the more I look, the worse things were getting, but you just can't help yourself. You're that desperate. And I remember thinking like, you know, where, what is this place? Where is everybody? You know, I just, I feel so alone. I just feel alone. Even, uh, yeah, a guy sitting next to me, but you're, you're alone. You, you've never felt so alone like you, like I did in that moment. And as soon as I thought that, I began hearing the screams of millions and millions and millions of people. And Oh, my heart, my heart, hearing them scream and wail in torment. I mean, you know, we, we see these little clips, you know, online, and they just don't even touch it. Nothing that you've ever seen. No video. I, 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 I wish I could and hope prayerfully maybe someday I can make something that might even come close to what I saw. You know, we're, we're so desensitized by the stuff Hollywood's putting out anymore, the horror and the films. I don't watch that, obviously, anymore. But there, even the point, you know, after, before I repented of watching that, I just, I was so desensitized. But in hell, it is so real. And you just, you're shocked at just hearing these people scream. It made me sick to my stomach. Um. All of that, all of that was the first level of torments. Hmm. So there's other levels. What else did you see then? Yeah, 
So from there, I couldn't handle the screaming. I could just couldn't handle it. And so out of desperation, I'm, I got to get something. I can't listen. I can't hear that. I can't handle that because it's real. This is real. This, these people are really screaming like me. And, um, and so I'm just desperately searching for something, anything. And then suddenly in front of me, um, where the rock is, I began seeing these black shadows darting just very quickly. I could see them darting in and out of the flames. I could see them going in and out and through the rock as they pleased. But oh, it's so frustrating trying to describe evil. Yeah. They, they were about three to four feet tall and pure black. A black that I never knew could possibly exist. The only possible way I could even try to describe them was that if a black hole in our universe could take on bipedal form, it was that powerful of an evil. And it was so thick. I just knew, I knew it for a fact. I could, I could go like this and just pinch the evil in between my fingers. Mm. You know, I, Again, if something's my opinion, I'll just state it as such, and I'm always open. But after what I experienced, I'm personally convinced that what we experience here on Earth is the aftermath of obliging evil um, that comes from the enemy, being led to commit murders and genocides and all these things. They're just horrible, but it's not the essence of evil itself. We're experiencing what happens when someone obliges it. What I saw in these things, I was staring at, and I was in the presence of the absolute source of pure evil unimaginable. It was so bad. It was so terrifying. Everything else was terrifying, but now I'm experiencing terror on a whole new level. And it was so bad that I completely froze. The fact that our physical brain can only handle so much is one thing. And then you get into the supernatural realm, and it's just so far beyond this physical realm. I'm in the spirit realm, and the evil coming from these things was so bad, even my spirit body couldn't handle it. That's how bad it was. My spirit body could not handle this evil, and I became stiff as a board, which meant I stopped screaming. And that was very bad. The instant I stopped screaming, three of them ran up to me so fast. And again, I'm seated, you know, and, you, and just in case too, you being in a seated, more comfortable position while you're experiencing torments unspeakable is yet another form of torment, by the way. Um, I'm, I'm seated and I can't go anywhere. So there's one in front of me, one to my left, one to my right. The two on my right and left, they grab my wrists. And they jerk my hands up in the air. In hell, you cannot fight back. You have no strength whatsoever. Um, imagine not sleeping for an entire month. For one month, not even one second of sleep. And for that month, no food. And for that month, no water. That's how I felt in hell. They jerked my hands up and I could do nothing. And then the one in the middle... Suddenly, it had a, a wooden plank in its hands, and it slammed the, the plank down on my lap. And then, then when I looked back up to it, it suddenly had a nail in one hand, or nails in one hand, and a hammer in the other. And I instantly knew this was pure mockery of Jesus. The two forced my hands down on the plank, and the one in the middle it puts a nail on my finger, and it begins driving the hammer like this, just smacking it. And the first hit of the nail went right through my finger. The second hit pretty much cracked it, and my finger went off to the side. And then the third hit bent the nail over. And then from there, it, would just, it didn't care if it was hitting nails or smashing my fingers. And it was just going back and forth. And its head was back like this, and it was cackling like this wild, insane cackling noise just hitting like this. 
and suddenly I could feel the pain again. And I began screaming again. It felt like lightning bolts were going up and down my arms. And, it, and uh, I have no idea. You're just, you're so desperate. You're so desperate. I remembered I looked to my, to the demon at my left and I was about to beg it for mercy, even though I knew it was a complete waste, but it was all I could do is just beg it for some kind of mercy. And when I saw it, I suddenly saw it in its full manis- manifestation. It was no longer a black shadow. And it was absolutely horrible. It was just the most horrible entity I've ever seen. Um, the best I could, just, I've had, because I'm I'm an artist, right? I write music, I draw. If it's artsy, I do it. I've had people like, could you draw it? I'm like, I could, but I don't want to. I don't want to entertain them at all. Um, so, but it looked like, Part man, part wolf, part bear, and part pig or hog. If you took all of those and mashed it into an entity, its skin was just rotting and disgusting yellow, and and its teeth were just razor sharp. They were all crooked and nasty, but razor sharp. And then its eyes were like a lizard, but they were blood red, blood, blood red. And it had a black cloak on too. And as I'm screaming and I'm looking at it it, with eyes just, you know, trying to beg for mercy, when I started screaming again, I saw the demon's head go back and its eyes became euphoric. Mm. I could tell it was high on my pain. It was high on Mm. my pain. And that I come to know was the second level of torments of hell is what the demons do to you while you're there. Things I can't even describe. They're that horrible. Things unimaginable they do to you. Um, Did you see another level? Yes, then it's it's amazing. It just blows my mind now when I think back to this experience that just when you think it can't get any worse, you realize you've only just begun. You've only just begun. Then, and I now I realize that this was the Lord revealing this to me one, one at a time. If I had to experience it all at once, I don't think I would have survived. I, uh, I just don't see how I could have. So he was, he was allowing me to see this in these layers, if you will. In that moment, it was as if the demons disappeared and the flames of hell, they were still there, obviously, and everything was still there but it was felt at much less capacity because there was a new reality that I needed to grasp. And that new reality for me was the word forever. Up until that moment, I just took that concept of eternity with a grain of salt. And I had always figured I'll, I'll, I'll understand it in that day, in that day I'm with, you know, the Lord, I'll get it. I, I just can't get it. I'm, everything's temporal here. So how could I get it? And that's another reason why I know this was not a dream. Because in that moment, I understood eternity perfectly. I understood it simply. Just like we get one plus one equals two here. I understood eternity. And the level of doom that came over me I knew that I was going to be in this place forever and ever and ever and ever with no end at all. After I'd been there for a trillion years, I was only just beginning. And I would scream and scream and scream. But I had to scream at an amplitude that was pleasing to hell. Because if I didn't, the demons would come back and do even worse things to me. And that reality of eternity was so foreboding. My heart became like an empty nothingness. I knew for a fact I deserved to be here. 
I knew at that moment where I was, I'm in hell. And suddenly that realization of, you know, again, this was the Lord showing me what it's like to be a person who rejected him. Cause I knew I rejected him my whole life. He reached out to me in so many different ways through so many different people all throughout my life. And I rejected him every single time without just cause. I rejected him because I wanted to be God. I wanted what I wanted. My will be done. Not your will, God. Get I don't I, you know, I don't want anything to do with this God because I want to be God. And uh I deserve this. I was gonna be here forever. These demons are insane with hatred. They're out of their minds with hatred. There's no bribing the demons. The only conversation you're having with the demon is screaming. That's your conversation with them while they cackle and laugh at you. They will mutilate you and use your body parts to beat on you with. Things, just un, un, unimaginable things. And I just knew this was my forever. There was no break. There was no pause. There was no rest. Not even for one second. No rest. None. Zero. Screaming and screaming and screaming and screaming for the ever and ever and ever and ever. And that uh, that reality of eternity, that was the third level of torments. And then what? Then, then God showed me the worst part about hell. I knew in that moment I would never see God again. And that was the fourth and final torment. And of all the torments of hell, nothing, nothing touches when you know you will never see the one who created you who knew you intimately before he even spoke the universe into existence, who made you uniquely you and loves you for who you are. The one who spent your whole life offering you life and freedom and peace and purpose and a destiny in him that's eternal and goes on forever. And I spent my whole life believing in anyone or anything but him. Everything else goes, but no Jesus. No. And I would never see God again. And uh, when that reality came over me, I I know now that I, I could not I could not take that. I could not handle that. I was just done. There's no I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. I was about to lose my mind. And the last thing I remembered feeling was this. I didn't hear words from the Lord, but I felt the essence of what he wanted me to know. This is what happens to people who reject the Lord. There's no other place for you to go. Don't be offended, my, my Catholic brothers and sisters. I love you. There is no purgatory. There is no nirvana. There is no... Well, you don't believe in God, but you don't really like Satan either. So here's your little happy place. No. He created us to be intimate with him forever. And intimacy in heaven is not like here on earth. Like I said, where the end of you is and where the start of God is, no one knows and no one will ever know. That's the intimacy. We are to be one in him and with him, including our entire existence. And that is the finality of his purpose for us. So when we reject him and we, I don't know how, how can people do that? How can people reject such love? God will not force people into heaven. He is a gentleman. He's inviting everyone, come. And if someone wants to refuse that in this life, then unfortunately there's only one other place to be where God isn't. 
And that's where the fallen angels are and where they they're inevitable and the lake of fire where death and hell belong. God does not want to see one person destroyed. Not one. And so, after that realization, just one last thing, is after that mm -hmm. realization, I remember opening my eyes. I was still laying on my side. I had not moved an inch. I simply opened my eyes, and I was looking out my bedroom window, and I was seeing the sunrise come up through the blinds. It wasn't waking up. I just opened my eyes, and now I'm not in hell anymore. And I'm looking out the blinks at the sunrise. It wasn't easy for you coming out of that. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. It, um, oh, his grace. Oh, his grace. How beautiful God's grace. Because there, I'd never experienced anything like that, right? And there was no warning there. Hey, Joel, by the way, you're scheduled for a visit to hell. You know, you might want to brace for impact. There's no nothing. I just there I was and there I wasn't. And now here I am. And I like, how do I. How do you even tell people? How do I tell people what I just saw? If it was a dream, I would have said, hey, hon, good morning. You won't believe this. I just had the worst dream unimaginable. But I there's no. I am not going to degrade my experience to a dream. I was in spirit and it was a spiritual experience. I was instantly there and then I was instantly not there. And so I firstly do what I especially did at that time and it's bottle it up, just internalize it. Um, but it really began to hit me when, you know, the next day or the next day or two when I went to the grocery store, it was, a, it was really like the first time I was in a public place and there were people all over. And I, I just stopped and I'm looking around at all these people and I'm not looking at people. And I tilt still to this day, Julie, I can't look at people the same anymore. I can't. I'm like, I'm standing there in the grocery store and I'm like, how, how many of these people have no idea they're just going about their life. They don't have a care in the world, They're, you know? And they have no idea that hell is waiting for them. And and, and that's when my wife, you know, like, Joel, let's help. You know, and I kind of was like, oh, okay. And I, that's when she began to notice, like, that was becoming different. I, um, I just had trouble. I really had trouble being mm -hmm. around people. After for that. like a month, right? It took you a, it took you a little bit of time to get back into the. Yeah, it it actually took about four years. Mm. I was dealing with it. I'd make right. myself go to work, but it just when I had to go somewhere, I went because I absolutely had to, and I just I didn't look at people. I just focus on what you're doing, mm. and just mm. try to shove it down, shove it down, you know. So. Why do you think he showed you hell? Because this little teeny existence called the universe, called length, width, height, and time, and space, and matter, this is not your ultimate reality or your reason and purpose for existing. This earth that we live on is like a classroom. This is one of the more, if not one of the, if not the, of all the eternal existences that there are. Believe me, when we say God is eternal, we have no idea. Wait till you're in his presence. He is so far beyond us, it's not even funny. And the earth realm and this physicality is a very low primitive form of existing. And the purpose of it is that we learn how to grow in our relationship with the Lord and grow in the spirit. And so he want, he showed me heaven 
He showed me hell, and he's shown me more things than this, too. We just don't have time for it right now. Because when he, cre he creates us with our own unique purposes. Some people are artsy-fartsy, and some people crunch numbers. We all have our gifts. We all have our reason, and that is my reason. He mm -hmm. predestined this before everything, that I would be shown these things, and that I would share it with the world, because the Lord knows my passion for him. And my love for him. And I'll t I'm will i going to tell everyone and the whole world. Was it a wake-up call for you personally? It, You know, it would be a wake-up call for anybody to, to see to see hell. It, it would be. It's, um, it, was, it, it wasn't that the, it wasn't like a wake-up call. Like, Joel, this is where you're going to end up if you don't start, if you don't get your head on straight. No, it was Joel. I am showing you what happens to people who reject me their entire lives. He made me experience what it's like to be someone who had rejected him their whole lives. That was how I was when I was in hell. And of course, once I came out of hell, I'm back to like, oh, geez, thank you, Jesus. I'm, I'm saved. Oh, I'm saved. So it wasn't a wake-up call for me. It's a wake-up call for the world. Because there are people who profess to believe in Jesus that claim, no, there's no way a loving God would send people to a place like hell, you know, and hell doesn't exist. Yes, it does. And it is far more real than this reality. It is real. And it's sad that people end up there. Well, Joel, I just want to thank you again for sharing your experience of seeing both heaven and hell. How has that shaped you now into the person you are today? You know, you would think an experience like that would just make me, those experiences didn't uh, do much to change me. Um, as much as when I came to the place where I was ready to fall in love with Jesus. So... I've had uh, emails from people like, oh, I've been praying that I can see Jesus. I mean, that's and that's fine. That's a fine prayer. But Jesus wants you to fall in love with him. You will see him. We will all see him in time. But what he wants is our love. He wants us to love him as much as he loves us. And don't think that's impossible because you were created in the image and the likeness of God. Mm. Amen. That's beautiful. Would you end us in prayer today together and for whatever you feel that you want to pray for us? Yes. yes. Okay, I'd be honored. Heavenly Father, we are so honored that we can all enter into your presence together now as your church body in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach beautiful, beautiful lamb who was slain and our king and our high priest, that because of all that you did, Jesus, all that you accomplished on that cross, you washed us and you cleansed us. You clothed us in your robes of righteousness. You made us truly alive, born again by the Holy Spirit. Yes. We are in a new covenant now, an everlasting covenant, which can never be broken we are seated with you in heavenly places, and we have your joy above all joys and a peace that surpasses understanding so that everything that we experience here, Lord, in this time, all of the difficulties, everything, we rejoice in you because you are using everything in our lives to mold us and shape us into the image and likeness of your son, Jesus. And this is why we can rejoice even in trials and even in tribulations. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I just ask that you would bring forth such a spirit of encouragement to people who have watched this today. They mm -hmm. do not have to be afraid of hell. Yeah. You did not create us to live in fear, but to live in love. That place is exactly why you came here, Jesus. And mm -hmm. not just to save us from hell, but to bring us to yourself in perfect love, in perfect intimacy, to where all that we are, our entire existence, belongs to you. You belong to us. We belong to you. 
And just like you said, Jesus, you are the vine and we are the branches. And all we need to do is abide in you and yes. you in us to abide, which means we're not going anywhere ever again. We're staying in your presence. And how easy that is to spend the day with you and fellowship with you and to be with you. And the more that is our focus, this love that we have, mm -hmm. everything begins to follow. And the changes we seek in our life become reality. Mm -hmm. I pray everyone is blessed by this, yes. oh Lord. And I yes. thank you for this ministry that yes. Julie has and that you will continue to bless this and send this out to the whole world, Jesus. Thank you. And we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Yes, Jesus, amen.